if you have um, have seen the the the, the fake uh, Einstein meme that's making its way around. Have you seen it? That everybody's a genius, but if you if you tell a fish to climb a tree, it will spend the rest of its life thinking it's stupid. You seen that? Anybody seen that one? No. And I, I, that's, it, no? You, how can I be more contemporary than you? <laughs> Ouch. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not listening to you. Um, it, it, Einstein also said, though, you can't re- believe everything you read in the Internet. So, come on, people, work with me. We've got to work, work on this. I mean, that's a great quote. In some ways, it's, it talks about the... the, the the necessity of the radical individual and the celebration of what it means to be fully yourself and whatnot. And, and it, it would be maybe cool if Einstein actually said it, which unfortunately he apparently didn't. Um, it was either him or Abraham Lincoln, one of those two, two guys. But I've been playing with uh, how, how, how is it possible uh, for us to be our radical selves in community. How is it possible for us to flourish as the man, the woman that God has called and created us to be in a church community that presses us into a conformed spirituality? Anybody else ever felt like your spirituality wasn't quite good enough? That you had to do something more or be something more? Um, that's, in other words, conforming is not just what the world does to you. Conforming is the way that we are taught how to, how to negotiate um, fitting in. And the only life that comes out of the conformed life is a dead life. Because if the only way you can be fully yourself is to be like somebody else, Anybody else done the math on that one? That's not even common core right there. That, that doesn't get you anywhere. The only, if the only way you can be yourself is to be like somebody else, and, if, and nobody calls out the, the advertisers, nobody calls out the, 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 the marketing schemes, but the truth is that's not going to get you there. And not only that, But the only life that a conformed life produces is a life that's like everybody else's, which means that there's a whole boatload of stuff that's not getting done because people aren't showing up at work. Because the the fact is, I I love that quote of, quote, quote, that semi-quote of Einstein's, because the truth is he didn't even believe that. He thought that there were probably only maybe a half a dozen stellar people who really needed to work hard in every, any given century uh, to, 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 to accomplish. And the rest of us were kind of like worker bees. And that's probably closer to the truth. Um, because we have, even in Christianity, a hero culture, a celebrity culture that presses us to a conformed and aspirational spirituality of an aspirational, a hoped-for uh, kind of way of being that will produce somebody else's life but not yours. So what, what does it take for you as the flamboyant, radical, individual man or woman created to be part of the image of God? What does that take to produce that outcome so that you can play your part in the orchestra, play, sing your part in the choirs so you can play your position on the field or on the court. Because that's really the, game, the end game, right? It's not so that you can be a radical individual out there in the middle of nowhere. That's no fun. But it's so that your radical individualism, the person you are, the individual you're created to be, actually has a place to fit in the jigsaw puzzle of God's wonder and mystery. And most of us spend chunks of our lives resisting the attempts of 
people to trim off the pieces of our jigsaw puzzle so that we fit into where they think we ought to fit. Any, any, anybody else have a family member like that? We put together a jigsaw puzzle every Christmas. Well, I should say my wife does. Um, I, I walk in every once in a while and say, no. <laughs> I, you know, my wife and, and, and my boys do the. I don't have the patience to sit there and find the one piece that fits into the thing. So I always come to the jigsaw puzzle table, at least I'm tempted to do this, with a pair of scissors in my pocket. Because then I can make stuff fit. Right? And, and, and I, th I think sometimes we approach or are approached in fitting in that way. The best way to make you fit is to trim off parts of you. And who gets to decide what parts of you get trimmed off? Well, whoever has the scissors. Whoever has the scissors. And the question I want to ask you today is who have you given the scissors to? Who, who have you given the scissors to? Who are you letting trim off parts of you so that you fit into their plan for their life? Because everybody has a wonderful plan for your life. Have you noticed that? It's not just God. Parents, roommates, boyfriend, girlfriend, everybody has a wonderful plan for your life, and it rarely fits the radical individual God has called and created you to be. So how do you become that person? And the answer is counterintuitive. But it becomes clear, hopefully, as we spend a few minutes with it. It's, it's, uh, I'm just building this off of, uh, of Paul's language in Romans chapter 12. He says, I beg you, brothers and sisters, on the basis of everything God has done for you, that you present your whole life as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and don't then be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can demonstrate that the will of God for you is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to you, every one of you, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but think having sound judgment as God has given to each one a measure of faith, a radical, unique individualism. Just as we have many members in one body and all the members don't have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. The only way to avoid the conformed life is to live the sacrificed life. It's the only way. Inevitably, without that sacrifice, without that laying down of the self, we will be consistently and constantly buffeted by the corrosive pressures, the erosive pressures of conformity. And like the river that runs through the sandstone or like the wind that blows through the desert and sands off the self, we will lose essential parts of who God has called and created us to be unless we put a whole mess in his hands and let him give us life from the inside out. Even our attempts to resist conformity result in conformity. Here's how it works. It's called negative fusion. Join me in intro to pastoral care and we'll talk about it until you get sick of it. Negative fusion basically is this. Um, if you tell me to do X, I'm going to do Y as a way of resisting your influence in me. That makes sense? But who's in charge of my behavior? You are. Even though you're doing it negatively, you're still telling me, essentially, you're shaping the identity that I have. So think how much 
of what we learn into, what we live into, is really a negative reflection. Still somebody else is put in charge of it. And you know as well as I do, you can't play the game really well if you're just not playing it the way somebody else is. Nor can you play it really well if you try and play it the way somebody else is. It's one of the things that I learned early on in church ministry is that I'd go to a seminar somewhere and get a box, church in a box kind of a, kind of a thing, right? And I'd come home and I'd, and, I'd, and I'd afflict this new program on my congregation. We're going to do this this year. We're going to take, yeah, we're going to do door to door. We're going to do bus ministry, whatever it was back in the day, right? And I discovered that the way, the reason those people who were putting on the seminar, the, if I did what they did to get what they got, instead of just doing what they got, I would have a whole lot. So what did they do? They prayed. God, what are you doing in our community? How can I, how can I figure out what you're doing and partner with you in that? Rather than saying, well, this worked over there, so I think I'm going to do it here. Do, do you know? So here's the strategy. I beg you, on the basis of everything God has done, first of all, you've got to believe at the end of the day that God is good, that he doesn't want to ruin your life, that he wants to give you your life. The first lie, the last lie, every lie in the middle that the enemy tries to teach us is that God is not good and that he wants to ruin your life. The truth is, the only life God ever wants you to have is yours. The problem is, he knows what that is and you don't. Why? Because almost from infancy, we are trained in a conformed life. We are trained to dance to the tune that other people call. We are trained to fit in to the jigsaw puzzle of family and friends and school and church. And so we learn the routine at the outside level. Does that make sense? That false self that we generate to survive in junior high school. The self that is out here doing business for us while we remain protected back here. That self is not our authentic self. Even if we become comfortable with the performance, we lose the self. And God won't allow that. He will not empower the false self. With his spirit. So he says, like I said Monday night in Excavate, BYOC, bring your own cross. You're going to die. Who's the you that's going to die? The false self. The false self that he can't empower, the false self that fits in, the false self that had been shaped by the pressures, the corrosive winds of conformity. The the scissor cuts of fitting in, even spiritually, right? Lay that self down. Lay that self on the cross so that coming out of the tomb of that crucified, sacrificed, surrendered life, the new life that is authentically you, filled with the Spirit, can arise. That's the goal. God doesn't want to give you anybody else's life. He wants to give you yours. So in the middle of our, of our, of our struggles for individualism, notice that if we don't live the surrendered life, all we get out of our struggles is either positive or negative conforming. The only way To avoid the conformed life is to live the sacrificed life, the surrendered life, because conformity will always reduce you to somebody else's history. Here's what I mean by that. Um, When you look at somebody and begin to emulate them, you are emulating the them that you remember. Meanwhile, they've moved on. So you're conforming to their history. You're conforming to what they used to be. You're conforming to a remembered image. And there's no life in that. 
There's only life in the present moment. You can't meet God in somebody else's life. Just in yours. And just in yours now. So the only way to resist that corrosive effects of conformity is to have this solid core of transformation that pushes out from the inside and resists from the inside out the, 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 the pressure, the culture of death that comes in to trim off bits and pieces until, it, until it, the you fits in somebody else's puzzle. How do you... How do, you, how do you do that? Well, here he tells us, don't, don't be conformed to the world. Don't let your spirituality be shaped by, 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 by what you see out there. Let, let the life of Christ bubble up from within you and be shaped. You're not ever going to be a star forward on the soccer team if you try and play like your best friend who's a defenseman. You'll never get there. You got to play your game. So, so what does that mean? That means that the exercises, the drills, the life the experiences, everything in your life is calculated to make you radically you. So the more we try and fit in, the more we try and trim our own lives, the less you emerges. So, so Paul's language is very simply this. Don't be conformed to any of the worlds that you're living in. either positively or negatively. Instead, be transformed, changed, empowered, life from the inside. There's an enormous pressure, isn't there, that we face to fit in, to be conformed. It's, it, but the, the way to resist that, Paul says, is that life of transformation. It's, it's like, um, I use this in another case, so... so you maybe have heard this before, but, but the, the, you know the fish, the, the, the aquatic creatures that swim at depths way, way, way below sea level, right? That are, that are, that are three, four, five, six thousand feet below the surface of the ocean with hundreds of pounds of pressure on them. How do they survive? They have in them a capacity to push out with a pressure equal to the forces that are pressing in. So they swim in a neutral environment. They don't even feel the pressure that would crush them without that internal pressure pushing out at the same level. That's what he's saying. The best way to avoid conforming is transformation. How do you get transformation? Surrender. Because it's the life of the Spirit. It's the power of the Spirit that pushes out against that inevitable pressure to conform. Is there anybody else that feels that? How do you say no when everybody else is saying, oh, yes, you can say yes? How do you walk away when everybody else is saying, what a wuss? How do you resist the pressures either Christian or non-Christian, positive or negative, when all around you the corrosive effects, the fitting in effects are present. How do you do that? And Paul says there's only one way. It's the surrendered life. Because there you tap into a resource. If the seed doesn't fall into the ground, Jesus said, and die, it looks like just all the other seeds. But if it dies, new life springs up. You tap in to the creative power of the universe that revels in individuality. Billions of stars, billions of daisies, every one of them known by the God who will empower your radical individuality who loathes conformity so much that he created the universe in such a way that even every snowflake here today, gone tomorrow, is unique. Every fingerprint 
is unique. Who did that? That's crazy. That's what he wants from you. Whenever we try and fit in and trim our souls to fit somebody else's jigsaw puzzle idea of how we ought to be, he's saying, no! Cut it out! I didn't make you to fit in like that. Stick with your shape. I'll find a hole for you somewhere. I'll find a place for you to fit somewhere. Don't don't force it too soon. You'll shape yourself into death. Anybody hear the no of the Father that loud over your soul? So how do you avoid that? Sacrifice. Trust me. I got this one. I know the life I created you to be. I'm the one who shaped your DNA. I'm the one who counted every hair on your head. I know your name. Don't be conformed. Be transformed. And at the end of that, you will be able to look back and say your life has been good. It's been acceptable and perfect. And, and here's where it gets really cool, you'll have a part to play with others. Because the goal is not radical individuality for the purpose of independence. The goal is radical individuality for interdependence. You're needed somewhere. Somebody's counting on you. Somebody's waiting for you to be fully yourself, if I can use this image, so that they know where they fit, so that their part in the puzzle is shaped. Have you ever put a jigsaw puzzle together? What do you, what do you, what do, you do? The fir- I mean, at, at least as I watch Judy and, and the boys put them together, the very first thing they do is they do the edges. Where's the edges? Where's the edges? Where's the boundary? And they build in from the outside. We have, we have pieces in place so we know where the rest of us fit. This is the point. It's not so that you can be a radical individual out there on some planet of you land. It's so that you have a place and a part and a position to play, a place to fit, something to do that is part of the larger picture of what it means to be the image of God. It's what it takes to image God, right? Genesis 1, the entirety of humanity, male and female, all together, past, present, future. That's the image of God. We need you to show up. Because when you aren't fully you, an essential part of the team's not there. Yeah, but I want to be the star player. Sorry, that's not your call. You're living a surrendered life. I want to be the soloist. No, 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 no. You don't get to determine that. You're living a surrendered life. If you need to sing the solo, he is very happy for you to sing the solo. But my guess is we can't have too many solos. Otherwise, we don't have a solo. We just have very loud choirs. All singing melody. How boring is that? As an amateur magician, magician, yeah. As an amateur musician, <laughs> I'm really impressed with people who can sing the melody really well. But you know, the artists that really blow me away are the guys who can hear the groove and push the solo by singing harmony. You listen to the Motown era albums, and that band made those hits. Is there anything wrong with just playing bass in the band? Is there anything wrong with just being the guy on the sidelines who cheers? See, if you don't live the surrendered life, you will live a conformed life that says the only worthwhile life is the star life. No, 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 no. That's why you got to live the surrendered life. So that you have a place. So that you fit. 
into what God is doing. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. But I got to say, if Paul were writing this letter to our culture, to, to our Gen X's, Y's, and Z's, he would say, don't think more lowly of yourself than you ought to think either. That's as crippling as the other. Because the truth is, this is the only way to the new. This is the only way to play is one position at the time. Have you ever, ever watched little kids play soccer? They kind of play it in a clump. You know, wherever the black and white ball is, all of them are there all the time. Right? And inevitably, you got one kid who really kind of gets the game. Maybe he's been playing club soccer since he was like two or something, right? He knows where everybody's supposed to be. He knows that if everybody played their position and just got him the ball, we would win. So what is this kid doing? He is coaching the whole team. He is playing the whole team all by himself. He is telling, you go, you're there, you're there, you're there, you're there. And so that when the ball comes to him, he is disoriented on the field because he's been busy playing everybody else's position. I'm not much of a, of a basketball fan, but I love watching the beauty of the saints. Is that basketball? Who's the basketball team that won last year? See, I don't know anything about this stuff. And this was my check to find out who you were playing. If, are you paying attention? Who won, who won the NBA championship last year? Did I get the right city? Didn't even get the right city. Holy cow. But I, can, can, can my illustration still work or is it too late? Okay, everybody do the illustration yourself. Get back to me when you're done. All right, but do you know what I, do you know what I mean when I, when, when I see a, t a team of people who knows how to play the game and plays with other people who know how to play the game and lets everybody play their own position as well and po as they possibly can? This is what Paul is saying. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Think accurately. You've been given a measure of grace. Play your position. Mind your own business. Don't mind everybody else's business. Pay attention because you are built for radical individuality transformed from the center that fits in to the larger work that God is doing. Not for independence, but for interdependence. And the only way to do that without being crushed to conformity is transformation. Let's pray. Um, surrender is not a word that we like very much. Surrender is um, giving up. Sacrifice is losing. So, Lord, when we sit with this text and sit with the implications of it, no wonder we resist it. But even in our resistance of it, we find ourselves longing for the life that only sacrifice can produce. Hardly anybody wakes up with conforming on their minds. But that's what happens. Spiritually, relationally, even our education gets shaped by it. We gauge our success not by how well we did, but how well we did in comparison to everybody else. Oh God, you didn't build us for that. You didn't create us for that. 
pray that you would give us courage to risk the price of being ourselves. Surrendering so that the very Spirit of God can transform these mortal bodies with resurrection power so that we can play the part you want us to play. Help us, help us, help us. And I pray, Lord, very particularly as we quit this morning for that man, that woman, who is hearing the no loudly from heaven as they have made increasingly conforming decisions in the last few days. I pray that you would give them courage to hit reverse, that you would give them courage to wake up every morning with a yes, Lord, to crawl on the altar, to hand you the knife, to let you to determine what their life looks like. It's the only way to avoid conforming. We don't have it in us not to conform unless we sacrifice, unless we surrender. So help us. Amen. Thanks, guys. At Vanguard University, you'll join a Christ-centered community pursuing a spirit-empowered life. For more information, please visit vanguard.edu.